again and welcome to Forum for a Better Understanding. Sometimes we start a series at Channel 49 that really has to have another episode to kind of bring it to its completion. We've been visiting two weeks now about the Office of the Independent Review. We showed you two weeks ago the 25-year history building up in this wonderful search for oversight to the Fresno Police Department. A week ago we were here and we had interviews with um, Eddie Aubrey and guests on the panel and also people from the Central California uh, Criminal Justice Committee asking serious questions to Eddie about his work. Well today, in our third part in this series, Eddie Aubrey is going to be back with Rebecca and Ellie and what we're going to be doing is looking at some more questions and give Eddie a chance to talk about his, his commitment to oversight here in the city of Fresno. Our three guests today again are Eddie Aubrey, who has been since November of 2009 the independent reviewer for the police department here in Fresno. I want to thank him for his work and for the report that we'll be discussing today, Eddie. Thank you. To his side is Rebecca Rangel, who is the program manager for the Youth Empowerment Program at Kingsview Behavioral Services. She is a co-founder of this Central California Criminal Justice Committee and is right now co-chair of that committee. And across from me is Ellie Bluestein, who for most of her life has been committed to peace and justice pursuits, is a co-founder of this wonderful committee that looks over criminal justice in the Valley and is here again to help us look at the need to keep being on task with the Office of Independent Review. I wonder if each one of you now could tell one reason why it's important that we even did a third program on the forum over the Office of Independent Review um, and why you're here today to be on that panel. Eddie, could you start? Well, I think it's important to go ahead and uh, have another series or the third part of it uh, because it's important to answer the rest of the questions and answer some more uh, and provide the public with valuable information about the office since it's still only a year old and a lot of people don't know about it and then they still wonder well what it does the office actually do so I'm happy to be back as part of that community outreach to let folks know what's going on. Thank you for being back again Eddie. Rebecca why would you want to be here again today? Well, for the same reasons that Eddie just mentioned, uh, we did have a list of questions that we thought were very important and we didn't really get to complete them. But also to continue this dialogue because I think it's valuable as a community person to, um, to engage with Eddie in talking about some of the, the issues in our committee, our community, sorry. Thank you, Rebecca. Ellie, why is this so important to have a third program? Because people really don't know about the office yet. And the more we, we spread the word, the more useful it is to the community. And we also learn from this about what can be done. Things come up all the time because there are the, uh, the relationship between the community and the police department keeps changing too. So the more we learn about it, the better we're able to build a good relationship between the police and the community. Thank you so much for being here, all three of you. And Eddie, one thing we didn't do enough last time is give you a chance to even introduce yourself mm -hmm. and your project, the Office of Independent Review. Would you like to tell us a little bit about what we need to know about your work? Well, yes, I would like to go ahead and do that. <laughs> First of all, uh, I just want to give a little bit of a background as far as where the office is, actually. Uh, the Office of Independent Review is located at 2300 Tulare. Uh, in Suite 120. So uh, you can reach us at that office or you can actually call our phone number at 498-1400 and you can give that number a call. Or you can reach us by email at oir at fresno.gov. Uh, so those are means and ways that you can either contact us by mail or email or by phone. Uh, the Office of Independent Review, of course, was established by the resolution back in 2009 and it, it uh, was led up by uh, Mayor, uh, both mayors that were here, uh, Alan Autry and, and Mayor Swearingen, and it was uh, uh, put into place uh, when the city council voted on it and made the resolution. So that was important for that process to happen. Uh, 
the model that they chose is the Office of Independent Review. And just to let the folks know that there's three different tiers of civilian oversight. And civilian oversight starts off at the Office of Independent Review, which is a review model. Uh, the second tier is an investigative model, which is they do independent investigations or they do investigations alongside uh, the police department. And then the third model is a, a, a civilian review board or an inspector general or police commission where you have a group of people looking at the information and making a decision. And they also have uh, investigators that are part of that. So there's three different levels. The Office of Independent Review is at the uh, entry level of all three of those as it, it tiers up to investigative model, to the uh, civilian review board or police commission model. So those are the three types of models, and uh, the, the city of Fresno chose the Office of Independent Review. And I think as Ellie talked about, and I think Rebecca already mentioned, that uh, actually the purpose of the office is enhancing public trust and strengthening community and police relationships. That's what the goal of the office is. And the office actually does that uh, in different ways. Um, the purpose, of, I mean, the office has five different areas that we look at. Uh, those areas are uh, the audit investigations, or audit reviews, I should say, and uh, the second area, and I have my, and we do have these pamphlets here that we do have and make available to uh, the public. So, uh, we, so the first office, uh, the first part of it there is the uh, audits. That's what we, prim that's what I primarily do. And uh, in the audits, we do a various amount of things. We audit the police internal affairs investigations that they do. So I review the complete files, I listen to audio tapes, I look at the pictures, I look at all the evidence that's compiled in that particular internal affairs investigation. And the internal affairs investigation can result as somebody claim, uh, alleging a, uh, unlawful or excessive force or discrimination or any of those other categories, biasness, things like that. That's what would trigger a uh, investigation. So uh, the other investigations or audits that I look at, I should say reviews, uh, that I look at are officer-involved shootings. So when there's an officer-involved shooting, I respond at 3 in the morning out to that particular scene, and I observe and watch what goes on. I actually go through the walkthrough of the, off, of, of, the, of the crime scene. I take a look at what's going on. I follow that up after we're completed at the scene, going to the police station and listening and watching all the interviews that take place uh, after that. So that's one part I perform. I already talked about the use of force investigations. I also review in custody deaths and collisions during pursuits and complaints of alleged bias, as I indicated. So that's just one part of the five things that I do. Now that takes up a whole oh, yeah. huge amount of uh, space. Uh, the other things I do is I review the in, in, inquiry complaint logs where people make inquiries that don't make it to a complaint, but it's an inquiry about maybe professionalism or uh, rudeness or something like that. So I review those on a monthly basis. Uh, the other thing that uh, I, the office does is that we look at uh, the early alert system. And that is a system that they put in place a couple years ago that looks at officers that repeatedly come up as far as investigations uh, or officer-involved shootings. So I, start, I look at those kind of things to see if there's a pattern or some, some other issue that comes up. Uh, the fourth and fifth items that I actually do are uh, uh, being a resource to the community and being a resource to the police department. Obviously, the police department giving them better practices and things like that, but to the community as far as a community uh, resource, and I think that is, I think that's a huge part of, yeah. of the office is because to help enhance the trust with the police department and the community being that facilitator to go ahead and provide transparency, to provide some communi better communication. And I think when we have more meaningful communications with the public and the police department, that's where you're really going to get a lot of change. Now, before we move on to the four questions that were left on our ledger from last week, did Rebecca or Ellie have a question even to ask Eddie about the very opening presentation of what his job is? He basically gave us, in capsule, his job, his job description. Any follow-up question or comment about that job? Well, it's a, it's a big job. Oh, yeah. And we had hoped that there would be uh, two or three more people, which at least one was promised. But we're very glad that at least this has been maintained because there have been cutbacks 
in the department, oh, yeah. and we're very glad that uh, Ashley followed through on her commitment to keep this office alive. It is amazing that promises can be made at a good time that an office will be fully staffed, and then you find out it's Eddie mm -hmm. and Cindy, and that's it. And other cities of even equal size would have a, a much larger proportional... Yeah. Three, five, or six. So Eddie's got a humongous task, and that's why we wanted to thank him for doing it, and then to now look at, I guess, the four questions that are left. Actually, one footnote. Yeah, please, here. Rebecca. My understanding is initially that Eddie, it was going to be Eddie and, and two staff support, mm -hmm. and one of those two got cut. Mm -hmm. So originally it was three bodies. Yeah. And of course we're happy that we have Eddie and Cindy, but, uh, but it was three, it wasn't always two. So no. even even the OIR uh, position has already been cut by this administration. And I think Rebecca brings up a really good point because that position was a community outreach position. The thing that he needs most help with. So Exactly. And when did that cut come? How far back in time was that? Uh, that was immediately upon so, yeah. me taking See, the office opening. It, it, it was never funded. Exactly. So that's like saying there were three, but it's really there were two because there was only two. And that is really admitting um, an effort, but not necessarily the full, the full need was not met. Mm -hmm. However, it just makes Eddie that much more valuable and that much more necessary to do what he's called to do. Now, the next question, believe it or not, that's going to come from Kathy Mitchell is really a great one. So let's let her raise her question, and I know Eddie will have a response, and I am very sure Rebecca and Ellie will have a further comment about it. Let's hear from Kathy Mitchell. Okay. Okay, you're auditing an investigation where it's been determined that the officers were acting within existing policies and procedures. Can an action fit into the existing policies and procedures and still not be a good practice? Is there any way we can evaluate an action besides looking at whether or not it's within policy? What's so important about what Kathy said is, what if something is fine according to the way it's written, but it still stinks? Then what do you do? So Eddie, what happens with Kathy's case, which I'm sure happens more often than you'd like? That, uh, that's a real good question. And policies and procedures by police departments usually are com come from some background. Many of it does come from best practices. But the, the question is, uh, if it fits in the policies and procedures, is it something that needs to be changed or can be improved on or maybe doesn't meet best practices? Uh, and, uh, and so, yes, there can be those categories. Uh, for instance, let me give you a, a few examples. Uh, the one example that I can think of from my experience in law enforcement, which I didn't get to talk about. Oh, yeah, because you make, have that background. Exactly, and I'll just mention it now that uh, I come from a background being in law enforcement from the Santa Monica Police Department and the Los Angeles Police Department. Also, I'm a, I was a deputy prosecuting attorney, so prosecuting cases. And I was a judge pro tem, which is a part-time judge. So I did all that over 32 wow. years. So anyway, to give you a little bit more uh, an example, as a police officer, before when PCP was huge, the, the practice was that police officers, in order to figure out if it was PCP, would smell the odor of ether. And, to, and at that time, we all thought it made sense. And that was the practice. But then they realized, well, if you're smelling the ether, you're smelling the PCP. Therefore, you're getting high at the same time. The practice was changed. <laughs> I mean, those are, those are things that to normal people would make common sense, but it, in law enforcement, that's the way they thought at that time. And it's like, oh, yeah, right. Don't want to do that anymore. Uh, the second practice is actually before that I came here with Fresno Police Department. Apparently, they had a practice up uh, from another agency as a best practice dealing with uh, suspects out there that they would actually sit them on a curb. Oh yeah. Exactly. And uh, I know Chief Dyer has come out and said that practice has stopped because of, of the disrespect and, and the whole thing. On the other side, they're looking at officer safety issue. But, but you look at it and go, okay, that was the best practice we picked up from other departments, but it wasn't the right thing to do. So those are just two oh, examples yeah. of that. So I can see many times when I'm reviewing cases that even though it fits in the department policies and procedures, 
maybe it's the best practice, maybe not, but even if it does fit into there, I look at actually the tactics and the events that occur before that particular event occurred, such as the use of force, to see whether or not those practices or those tactics or the events that led up to it maybe can be changed or provide, training can be provided so that when it gets to this point, there is no use of force because the events that led up to it are different in the training that would be a uh, that would be a, a, a made available to the officers would prevent them to do that, even though it's within department policies and procedures right now. So that's where the biggest, that's, that's where a huge change uh, can occur, even though it's within the policies. Do either of you have a, a real follow-up issue, or maybe an example of something that you wonder, will that ever be changed? Is some policy, is there something that you're cognizant of? Well, the, the policy of sitting people down on the curb was one that we asked to have changed. We, we had complaints from people saying <coughs> that it was very uh, discriminatory and very <coughs> uh, disrespectful. And so maybe through uh, Eddie's <coughs> contact with the police department, maybe that was something that was changed. I wasn't aware that it had been changed because it's been that recent. The other thing Good. is that uh, communication <clears throat> has been a very important issue, how people are addressed by the police department. And <clears throat> this was pointed out to us very early on by some of the other uh, uh, review people that, we, uh, that came here. <clears throat> and so we wanted that stressed. And I think having someone in there with the police department makes it possible to stress that and to see that it's carried forth. Great. And one other thing, one thing that uh, was a very important part of the Office of Police Review, as it was called, was that uh, man many changes were made because of the observations of the reviewer. Though so you're in a position where you can make recommendations, it's not only answering <coughs> complaints, but it's seeing what the policies are and how it can be changed, and that's a very important aspect. You know, we do have to take our break in the middle of the program, so we'll take it now, but don't go far, because in one minute we'll be right back to continue the conversation with Eddie, Rebecca, and Ellie. Stay tuned. KNXT TV is proud to say thank you to all its viewers who have given their support for over 25 years. And only through your support is KNXT able to provide spiritual and informative programming. Please remember KNXT and your long-term support through wills, bequests, trust, and plan giving. Your gift is important to the future of Catholic television. Help preserve the strength of KNXT's message based on the teachings of Christ. Keep KNXT in your future plans. Hello again and welcome back to the um, second part of our program. We're on the third part of a series talking with Eddie Aubrey about the Office of Independent Review. And right now we have another question that's going to be posed by Matilda Rangel. And it's a very important one because it brings up the issue of the DA, which does create for us a really good point of discussion over in the absence of something, what's going to happen? Let's hear from uh, Matilda. Aubrey, I would like to know how we can strengthen your office so that you will be able to look into issues that are not currently addressed now that the DA no longer investigates officer-involved shootings. That's a, that's a great question, and just for those folks that don't know that the district attorney's office uh, stopped responding to officer-involved shootings to investigate those, uh, back in February of 2010, and that has been their policy since then. Uh, as an update for folks, uh, that the grand jury actually came back with a report on February 3rd of this year indicating that the uh, district attorney's office should respond and should get back into the business of investigating officer-involved shootings, and that's because they have the legal uh, jurisdiction to determine whether or not the shooting is justified or unjustified by law. 
uh, I don't have that ability because I review the administrative portions of the investigation after it's done for administrative policies, procedures, uh, those kind of things. I don't look at the legal point of view, nor do I have that jurisdiction to look at that. So uh, unfortunately, the office cannot respond and take over the duties of, of the DA's office because they have to be the ones that actually prosecute it. Um, so that, that's, why, that's why it becomes difficult, but it's nice to know that uh, the grand jury supports that the district attorney's office should be uh, doing this job again. Well, since they say they should be doing it, is it going to happen, or is it just a should be? Uh, their, 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 their job is to make it a recommendation, but now that recommendation is made public, and it's made public to the county supervisors, and uh, so everyone gets to look at that and now have a discussion about that. So uh, it's still ultim ultimately up to them to go ahead and make their decisions about that. Any follow-up? Well, just <clears throat> that we're the only uh, city in uh, California that does not have this uh, investigation by the DA's office. And that's pretty serious. They investigate Dinuba, they investigate the surrounding communities, but just not Fresno. So we're left out in the cold. Why is that? How did it happen that the DA's office decided we're just not going to do that? Uh, the information I have, which is of course uh, public information is they indicate that because of uh, the budget issues and the budget shortage that they had to make reductions and this was one of those areas that they decided to reduce and this creates a, a huge hole into yeah. uh, into uh, investigating like I said I can't I don't investigate or ask independent inf questions about investigations and 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 do that they actually do do that and as uh, Ellie mentioned that uh, uh, Fresno is the uh, is the only police uh, county that the district attorney's office wow. does not do this particular investigation. I'd like to add to that. Um, I think there was an analysis. I think uh, Eddie, you made this announcement at one of the chiefs' meetings that the the there were four or six metropolis in the state of California comparable to Fresno in size, mm -hmm. and that they all had their DAs doing these investigations. That's part one. Part two is. The police chief and the mayor have both gone on record as uh, wanting the DA to do these investigations. And in fact, a few months ago, I don't remember exactly, a couple of three, uh, that this issue came up before the city council, and they had 16 questions about being dumbfounded. They didn't even know yeah. that the DA w wasn't ma doing these investigations. And many questions came up, and I don't believe that even city council has followed up on this. I think they're just kind of shaking their heads saying, well, what is the reason for that? Moving on, we only have, they say, five minutes, and so we have two questions, so that's going to be two and a half minutes each, I suppose. Um, this is going to be from Rebecca, who's here, but we're going to see her at a meeting, which reminds us there was a very important meeting that we did film this interview in. It lets you know that there is a very important committee, the Central California Criminal Justice Committee, that looks at such things as this. Let's go to their meeting and hear from Rebecca. Uh, Mr. Aubrey, after your first year in office, can you tell us what your primary focus is going to be? Uh, my, my primary focus has got to be multifaceted. Uh, uh, even though the office is small, I have to look at certain things. And I think it's uh, issues that are of public concern. That would be the officer-involved shootings, um, the use of force cases, and again, the early alert system, which tracks officers if they're repeat yeah. Uh, if their names come up repeatedly on use of force incidents or things like that because that needs to be examined. So those are the issues that I will look at and to have meaningful dialogue in the community about those concerns. And Ellie's last uh, point, we could go to the clip now to the meeting again and have Ellie ask the perfect question, well, what can we do to help? Let's hear how uh, Ellie phrased that question. You know, we have lobbied hard for 10 years to have the city establish an Office of Independent Review. And we are very eager to have it succeed and be effective. Is there anything we can do as an organization or individuals to assist you? Do Eddie. Well, I think that's a great thing. Events like this, having more forums where I can go out and speak with folks and talk with them about the community, having uh, your groups and other groups get together 
and with involving the police department and like I said have meaningful conversations even though maybe it might be some disagreements it might ruffle some feathers I think that's where you get people to go ahead and start looking at issues a little bit differently and that we're all working together heading in the right direction. Ellie you asked a question I'm wondering if you have um, a follow-up question to your own or a suggestion as to how you want people to become energized as you are to do something about justice and peace here in the city? Well, the first place is to, to really care about it, to really be convinced that uh, something has to be done. And w when you're in a position as we have been for 10 years, where we have been around and people have been calling us, and in a sense we have been acting as an OPR because there was no other place to go. So we know what the needs of the community are and how hard it is for people who have problems with the police to get help. Uh, and so then, then you, you want to do something to help it out. And I want to ask this of Eddie, but I don't know if there's time. Minute. Okay. Um, do you think it would be helpful to have a civilian uh, board that would... Uh, <coughs> be out in the community that people could approach them and they, then they could feed into you? Uh. Well, I think, I think that's something that we need to discuss and we need mm -hmm. to have some discussion about mm -hmm. that fact and see if that would be something that would work. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I think ideas like that need to be looked at and, and, and talked about in public and they're going to have looked at the pros and the cons of it there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, And to follow up what you just said, it's so important that people feel at ease to report anything they have to to the Office of Independent right. Review because we're not the police. Right. Rebecca, you have 25 seconds. Well, I just wanted to basically piggyback on what Ellie just said, which is uh, it seems to me that having an extension in terms of community people that kind of feed Eddie or provide Eddie with the support that he doesn't have is critical because initially once again the position had that that community outreach person and it doesn't exist so it just to me it's a piece of the puzzle that's missing a critical piece that's missing well I want to thank our wonderful committee the uh, Central California Criminal Justice Committee for having pulled this program together Eddie for being here, and for all of those who are committed to peace and justice here in the city. For the Forum for a Better Understanding, I'm Jim Grant. Till next time, God bless.